Thank you, everybody, for joining us in our little Bible study today. And we are going to be covering 1 Timothy chapter 5. But first, I have a question for you. Do you know where you're going to spend eternity? Are you going to spend it in heaven or in hell? This is the little card that has... I'm going to sh talk more about this little um, round thing later. But this is a little card that, that talks about hell. Mm -hmm. And it's for those people who believe they are good persons mm -hmm. and think they didn't need Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So those people are going to the hot place where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. But the people who realize, you know, this is a faithful saying that Christ came into the world to save sinners. So if you're a sinner, raise your hand. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody here, Rose, <laughs> raise their hand. Mm -hmm. um, then you qualify. And this is a kind of like in a monopoly. I want to just show you. It's a get out of hell free card. Mm -hmm. Get out of hell free card. Mm -hmm. Because our Lord Jesus Christ has done everything that's necessary to satisfy the wrath of God. And His blood is so amazing that it's paid for the sins of not all, only the people in prophecy, but also for us in mystery. As um, our dear Apostle Paul has said, Christ was a ransom for all. So um, we're very grateful for what Jesus Christ has done. And to tell you the truth, all that thrills my soul is Jesus. He's everything to me. And um, uh, we want to hear from him and what God says in his word today. That's all we care about. When my children were younger, there was a movie called The Never Ending Story. And we love that movie. And it talked about a book that had a never-ending story. And it was, you know, fiction and fantasy. Peter Falk was in it. And it had Pal Cord and the White Dragon. It was, it was really interesting. But we have a never-ending story because we're never going to plummet the depth or height or width of this book, the King James Bible, we're never going to be able to get all that God has said out of it. But, you know, with His Spirit in us, and as we read His Word, um, we can learn more and more. So this is the real never-ending story. Mm -hmm. This is the real one, because what God says is true. And God says things in such a literal, clear way, for the most part, you can take everything he says literally. Mm -hmm. So we thank him for his um, word to us. Mm -hmm. Let's begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Holy Father God, in Jesus' name, we come before you mm -hmm. and we thank you that we are accepted in your beloved Son because he has um, paid for our souls to be mm -hmm. redeemed from the bondage that we were in when we didn't know you. And we pray that many people will trust that Christ died for our sins and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and be saved, Lord, and that many people here will also come to the knowledge of the truth because that's what your will is and what you want. And we thank you for your word. Please help us all to have spiritual understanding um, of what you say, and that we will be accurate to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I want to thank all my uh, women for coming to the Bible study and helping us with the proofreading. Mm -hmm. Lauren Peters, Lynn Wellborn, Patty Carlson, and Maureen Parker. We're all a team working together to put out these commentaries for all of you. And um, so let's um, go over... 1 Timothy chapter 5. Patty, are you following? Mm -hmm. How the good minister is to treat the members of the church. 
um, verses 1 through 2 are older and younger men and women. Verses 3 through 16, widows, old and young. So that's the, you know, the m most verses are about that. Then 17 through 25 is about church leaders. In the next two chapters, chapter 5 and chapter 6, Paul is going to help Timothy to know how to deal with seven types of people. So it will be older and younger men, older and younger women, widows, church leaders, and then in chapter 6, servants or slaves, and false teachers and the rich. So when we come to chapter 5, which we're going to be covering the whole chapter, all these videos cover an entire chapter, um, someone may wonder when they come to this chapter about how can someone be dead while she or he still liveth. Mm -hmm. um, that's in verse 6. And what does wanton against Christ mean in verse 11? Then, um, what is meant by having damnation in <coughs> verse 12? And what does Paul mean by have already turned aside to Satan in verse 15? What is meant by double honor in verse 17? Why did Paul rebuke Peter to his face? We're going to kind of throw that in today. And um, why, when did Peter use his keys to help Paul? When was that? Um, what is meant by some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after in verse 24. So those are some of the things that we will be answering during this lesson today. So, let's do our review sentences for chapter 1. Teach no other doctrine, avoid fables, edify. So, Paul calls everything that is not his doctrine that he received from Jesus Christ, fables. Okay, and he also calls them vain babblings. So, there is a lot of fables and vain babblings going on in churches today all over the world. If, if they're not following Apostle Paul and what he said to the body of Christ. Um, chapter 2. Priority of prayer, God's will, and the role of women in the assembly. Chapter 3. Bishops, deacons, the congregation, and the mystery of godliness. Then chapter 4 was a good minister, and we covered that last week. And we also covered last week when sign gifts ceased. So if you haven't seen chapter 4 and you want to know the answer, then just go find that. And so now we're doing 5, and we want to remember that the kingdom of God is, has two realms, heaven and earth. And everyone who's in there are in there because of the blood of Jesus Christ, and they're in Christ. So, um, all of my Facebook videos have been turned into YouTube videos by Aaron G. And so you can just put in Marianne Manley and find me on YouTube. Also, I have a website, MarianneManley.com. And there's also another website, helpersofyourjoy.com, that has reading lists for how to read through the Bible in an organized way. Now, some people would like to join me in some incredible um, conferences that are coming up that I will be attending. So, um, this weekend, the Valentine's Day weekend, 14 through the 16th, I'm going to be at the Holiday Inn Express in... San Juan, I mean in San Clemente, San Clemente, California. Then in April, I will be at the Shorewood Church for the Grace School of the Bible uh, conference from April 24 to the 26th. And I will be in Chicago again uh, July 11th through the 16th for another Grace School of the Bible conference at the Holiday Inn in Itasca. So those dates, again, are July 11th through the 16th. <clears throat> so
So, in one of my books, um, uh, that, well, our, I should say our books, <laughs> that we recently did, I talked about, um, I did not give any dates for the rapture. I gave an educated guess, and I gave a window of time. And I said, don't say the, the dates, anybody. But I gave the date for, you know, the, the last possible time that I thought that Jesus could possibly um, rapture the church. And so it's that time or less, which means that, you know, we could be raptured at any time because no one knows for sure when the rapture will be. Mm -hmm. So that was how I worked that out. And in this book, I have, you know, what I believe is true is that God has a 7,000 year plan for mankind. And I have the um, Torah uh, calendar. And I also give the information for how I work out my, um, my window of time. And, it, you know, it's such an interesting topic that I didn't want to leave that out. You know, I thought, let's, let's address it. Mm -hmm. So, this here is a timeline from Sean Berceau on, um, you know, the three days and nights that Christ was in the heart of the earth. So, that, that's in this book. This is called The Certainty of the Pre-Tribulation Rapture, and it is available on Amazon.com in color, paperback, or in black and white black and white, for only six ninety five. The color is twenty two ninety five. Then we have a children's book, Just As God Said, in color and in black and white. And this book goes over the Bible in 50, it's an overview of the Bible in 50 easy pages. 50 easy pages. Lots of pictures, because children love pictures and most of us adults do too, don't we? Oh, yeah. We love pictures. Mm -hmm. And this is called, um, Why Was the Earth Without Form, Void, and Dark? And this one's only three ninety-five. So those are available on Amazon.com. And um, we have God's Secret, which is a primer for um, how to learn right division that goes over the Bible in, with lots of pictures also in 100 pages, and uh, the other one was 50 pages. Then we have Romans, a concise commentary, 1 Corinthians, a commentary, um, 2 Corinthians, a commentary, Galatians, a commentary, and this one's only 595. And all of those commentaries are gathered into one book to save money uh, without the introductory information. Uh, just a commentary um, in um, Treasure Hunt, Volume 1. Then we have Ephesians, a commentary, and Philemon, uh, Colossians, and, I mean, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, a commentary. Mm -hmm. So these two books are, um, those four uh, epistles are in Treasure Hunt, Volume 2, the prison epistles. And we're working right now on the pastoral epistles. So that's what we're going through. So let's get those out of the way. Okay. <clears throat> so I used to always wonder, you know, why if you plot out Daniel, uh, the, Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar's image that he had in his dream, why were the legs so disproportionately long, Com you know, because um, Nebuchadnezzar, there has been a Game of Thrones. The Game of Thrones is over who's going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So, God did not let any other nation rule over Jerusalem until Babylon. So Babylon took over and, uh, and destroyed the temple there in Jerusalem about um, 600 B.C., before, 600 years before Christ was born and died on the cross. Okay? So we start with the head of gold, Babylon, then, you know, the Medo-Persian and the Greeks, and then we have 
the, the king of the north and the king of the south. And these time of the Gentiles has been going on and on. And um, so I finally learned the answer when I learned how to rightly divide. The answer is that um, at the second coming of Christ, God, okay, the, uh, God has delayed the destruction of the feet. That's the answer. Okay? Mm -hmm. So these feet here are kind of like, you know, or legs, I should say. These legs are having cut off. So then when we close the chart after our rapture, you can see that the man now has legs that are much more proportionate to the body. Mm-hmm. You see how that works? Mm -hmm. So the destruction of the feet will be at Christ's second coming. Um, and he will come, and Antichrist will have, you know, be on the throne. He'll be the last of the Gentile kings. Oh, <laughs> so he'll be the last of the Gentile kings. And God calls him the Assyrian. So we don't know if, um, you know, he is partially a Jew. A Syrian Jew, mm -hmm. and maybe has a Gentile mom, mm -hmm. but this whole statue represents the times of the Gentiles that we will be going over in Luke 21, 24. Luke talks about the times of Gentiles. So, in, in the dream, Nebuchadnezzar um, has a dream that this uh, stone is cut out of a mountain without hands. And so that's what this represents. So that stone is Jesus Christ, and he destroys the feet. And that's been delayed in this dispensation of grace. Okay, so that's kind of solved that mystery. So let me just go over the timeline a little bit. So during the time... Uh, after Abraham and, um, you know, Moses, and then we had David. And David sat on the throne where? In Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, okay? Mm -hmm. He sat on the throne in Jerusalem. So the kingdom was prophesied in Daniel 2.44. Then when Jesus was on earth, the, the kingdom was at hand. So the kingdom was at hand when Jesus Christ was in his earthly ministry. Then um, they killed the king of the Jews, and he died on the cross. And they didn't, you know, they rejected him. And he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He was here for 40 days, and then he ascended up into heaven. Then he sent down 10 days later the Holy Ghost on the believing remnant in the upper room. And then they offered the kingdom again. It was a renewed offer of the kingdom that was going to be on the earth because it's a game of thrones. Mm -hmm. Who's going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem? So, um, who wants to look up Luke 21, 24? Okay, so now we find out that during the dispensation of grace in which we're living, last week we talked about the who's grafted in to, to the blessings of Abraham. And we said that um, the nation of Israel fell in Acts 7, but the little flock, or Peter and his group, continued to Acts 15. And then at the Jerusalem Council, they found out that Paul was the new apostle and that God had put their program on hold. So Paul... Um, explains in Romans 11 that Israel stumbled at the cross and fell later in the, at the stoning of Stephen, and um, Paul is now the apostle. So after um, Acts 15, Paul writes his first letter to the Galatian churches, and because he's already received the you know good and handshake of approval from the Jerusalem Council. Mm -hmm. And in the letter to the Galatians, Paul says that if anyone teaches another gospel other than his, let them be accursed. He says that two times. 
When God says something two times, it's established. Okay? So, during the dispensation of grace, no other doctrine uh, than the one Christ gave to Paul is supposed to be preached. Because that person then should be accursed if they teach the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. So, the kingdom has been postponed, as we found out. Yes, go ahead. What does accursed mean? Accursed means um, damned or condemned, mm -hmm. and so it is, um, you know, if they're saved, they're not going to lose their salvation, mm -hmm. but their work will not have, they, they'll not have a reward at the judgment seat of Christ, because their, it's, their work will burn up, okay? okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the kingdom has been postponed, in the Romans eleven twenty five. it says, that Paul, Paul says that I don't want you to be ignorant that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So Israel is blind in part until the rapture. The rapture right here. Okay, we don't know exactly when that's going to be. But after the rapture, God is going to, um, you know, begin working again with prophecy. The mystery program, this yellow part, will go up to li uh, live in the heavenly places, and then no one will be able to get to live in the heavenly places for eternity uh, again. That time period will be over, and Paul's uh, gospel will not be valid anymore. So then God will begin the gospel of the kingdom again, and, and he'll... Um, help people through the seven years of tribulation and then when things look really bad and Antichrist has gathered his army against Israel um, Christ will come and you know kill all those anti you know Antichrist will go to um, the lake of fire and uh, the false prophet will go there judge He's going to judge. He, well, no, he's going to put them... He doesn't have to judge them. He's already oh. judged them. Oh. They're going to the lake of fire. Those peop, those two uh -huh. are going to the lake of fire. Okay? Uh -huh. Because it says in the Bible that by the time Satan then gets thrown into the lake of fire at the end of the thousand-year reign <coughs> of Christ, that the false prophet is and, and um, Antichrist are already there. Okay? Uh -huh. Oh. So we went over that when we went over Thessalonians. Oh. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so you can read that in the Thessalonian commentary, which was the one about the pre-tribulation rapture. Mm. So then, um, you know, Christ will come and he'll establish his 1,000-year reign. And this will be a time when Gentiles in prophecy can also be saved. Okay? Right now we're having Jews and Gentiles in mystery being saved by believing Paul's gospel. But um, during the 1,000-year reign of Christ, um, Jews and Gentiles, well, Gentiles that believe uh, Israel, in, uh, God is the Messiah to sit on the throne, will, you know, be saved. And they'll be blessing Israel. Right now we're not blessing Israel, but, you know, we're blessing everybody. So we, we bless everyone that we can. And the way to bless and love somebody today is what? Telling them the good news of Jesus. Tell, exactly. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Lynn. Yeah, it's telling them the good news about Jesus mm -hmm. and helping them to, you know, have more at the judgment seat of Christ by teaching them how to rightly divide. Mm -hmm. And all of my books teach people how to rightly divide the word of truth. So without further um, commentary on all that, let's go ahead and um, start our Bible study for today. On, mm -hmm. um, you know what? I forgot was my glasses. Oops. Uh, okay. okay, there's there's a little box by my computer in the bookshelf. I'll take those. <laughs> okay, there's always something. So um, let's. Um, who's well, looking up Luke twenty one twenty four? Lynn. Oh, Lynn is. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's good. Thank right you. There, yeah. Um, thanks, Lynn. Shall I okay, read? Go ahead. you can read it, Lynn. Okay. When you come back, because I want you to see something when we read Luke twenty one twenty four, which talks about the times of the Gentiles, because the times of the Gentiles end at sec at the second coming of Christ. Go ahead, Lynn. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and 
shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trotted down of the Gentiles until the times the Gentiles be fulfilled. The times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so did it say Israel is going to be trodden down? No. Nope. No? Mm -hmm. What did it say? It's going to be trodden down. The Gentiles. Gentiles. Well, in where? In what? Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. Okay, that's very important to get. Mm -hmm. The the Antichrist is going to sit in the temple at Jerusalem. And it's all about you know who who sits on the throne in Jerusalem, okay? Game it's of not Thrones. about the Game of Thrones. It's not about Israel. It's now we're down to Jerusalem, okay? Mm -hmm. This is the spot that God has picked that He loves, and He's going to sit there. So let's um, get started. Um, go ahead, Marina, read uh, verse the first verse in five, chapter five. Rebuke not an elder. But entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren. Notice this, this paragraph began in 411. Look in your Bibles and see the paragraph mark there in 411. Oh, yeah. Okay, so now we're in the middle of that paragraph, and it's going to end in 6-3. See, then he starts a new paragraph in 6-3. So we're in the middle of this paragraph. Having given Timothy personal instruction regarding his assignment. That's what he did in the first part of this paragraph. His conduct and the welfare of the church, Paul continues to give him practical advice in the next two chapters on how to treat the seven types of people in the church. The older young and younger men, the older and younger women, the widows, the church leaders, the servants or slaves, the false teachers, and the rich. Because remember in verse 15 he said, But if I tarry long, that thou, I mean 315, I mean 315, no, 415, yeah, 315. <laughs> but if yes. I tarry long, that um, thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So mm -hmm. he's giving instruction to mm -hmm. Timothy. And these Pastoral epistles is what the pastors and deacons in our churches today should be following, mm -hmm. not something else. They should not be, you know, looking in other books. They should be, you know, ruling according to the Word of God. So, being a young man, Timothy had to be careful in his relationship to the elder men. Paul said, treat them as you would your father. Paul said, rebuke not an elder. That means rebuke them not publicly. Okay? We would not embarrass our fathers in public, but kindly and gently try to correct a point of error in private. It is a loving to correct someone. In Proverbs 9.9 9, it says, Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. We should all remain teachable. Timothy is to treat younger men as brothers. We want our brothers to know what is right, so we respectfully help them to see the truth. Um, Patty, verse 2. The elder women as mothers... The younger as sisters with all purity. We love our mothers and very warmly tell them the truth in all humility. We care about our sisters and want them to know the truth too. Keep your thoughts pure, is what he, he says to mm -hmm. Timothy. You know, because mm -hmm. if we're treating someone like a sister, then you know we're treating them the, the right way. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, men in the church, they have to be careful not to be alone with any women. Um, you know, because they don't want to give the appearance of things not being as they should be. <laughs> we care... Okay, so, um, the body of Christ is really a big family. This is why we refer to one another as a brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. Um... We are brothers and sisters in the Lord. 
There may be disagreement within a family, but members of a family should not quit on each other and say, I want a divorce. I'm out of here. Mm. You know? <laughs> we stick together. We know who our enemy really is. Mm -hmm. In Ephesians 6.12, it mm -hmm. says we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities in heavenly places, where Satan is right now, mm -hmm. the second heaven. The body of Christ members need to keep unity. No one is above another. The ground is equal at the foot of the cross. We are to have the same mind, which is Christ, the same doctrine, which is Christ, and the same love, which is Christ also. Um, he says in Romans 12, 16, Be of the same mind, one toward another, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate, be not wise in your own conceits. We can have the sameness as what we if as we all believe the same doctrine, which is that of mystery, and um, use the same Bible, the King James Bible, and follow the same apostle, which is Paul, to follow Christ. As it says in 1 Corinthians 4.16, 11.1, and 14.37. Let's go there. Um, Lynn, can you do um, 1 Corinthians 4.16? Sure. And... Um, Lauren, can you do 1 Corinthians 11.1? 1? And Maureen, do you want to do 1 Corinthians 14.37? Um, we are a happy family because by faith in God, we will all live together for eternity with God. Go ahead, Lynn. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Mm -hmm. And that was Paul. Uh, go ahead, Lauren. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Okay, so we follow Paul to follow Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Go ahead, uh, Maureen. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Okay, so... Paul is writing the commandments of the Lord by inspiration. Go ahead, Lynn, and read verses 3 and 4 in um, chapter 5. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn... No, no, for, for verse 3 first. Honor widows that are widows indeed. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents. For that is good and acceptable before the Lord. Before God. God. <laughs> the early church supported widows mm -hmm. um, who had no one else to help them. Um, remember, there was no Social Security or Medicare back then. Mm -hmm. Widows who really were in need financially for financial help should be recognized as deserving of that assistance by the church. But if they had children's or children or relatives, then those family members should show their devotion to service at home and repay their parents, grandparents, or other relatives. Doing so is good and acceptable to God. Um, verse 5, Lauren. Now she that is a widow indeed, and desolate, trusteth in God, and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. Paul identifies the qualifications of a widow who legitimately should receive support. The pastor and deacons should investigate um, uh, um, you know, these people, you know, the widows, um, a true widow is destitute of family support and care and she should be a woman who trusts in God and continues in labor um, to labor in prayer night and day widows who labor in prayer are doing the work of Christ no matter how limited she is she can still pray uh, verse 
6, Maureen. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. How is the younger widow dead while she liveth? If she is saved but only cares about pleasure and not the things of God, then she is dead while she lives. She is spiritually alive but functionally dead. She is serving herself, not God. She is being carnal in living like the unsaved. The uh, at the judgment seat of Christ is where believers are judged for service. Our sins have already been judged at the cross. We will not be judged for our sins again. Double jeopardy is against man's laws and also against God's law. She is wasting her life by not being useful to God. She will not have anything of value at the judgment seat of Christ. The carnal mind is an enemy of God, as it says in Romans 8, 7. Carnal believers are babes in Christ, as it says in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 4. They will suffer loss of reward, as it says in 1 Corinthians 3, 15. God does not want either men or women to be dead while they are alive. He doesn't want them to be spiritual zombies. Okay? The walking dead. That's why he writes in Ephesians, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead. Okay? That's someone who's functionally dead. And Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye will walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God the Father and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Trinity was there. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. That's Ephesians 5, 14 through 21. So um, verse 7, whose turn is it? Patty, go ahead. And these things give in charge that they may be blameless. We... Who are the they? Okay, they that may be blameless, that Paul wants Timothy to charge or command, it is the old and young men and women in 5, 1, and 2. Paul wants Timothy to make the requirements for true widows in the church known so that the families with widows will take their responsibility and all involved will be without fault or blame. <coughs> even the pastors and deacons. Paul also wants the widows to live godly and the church officers to do what is right as stewards of God's money. Uh, verse 8, Lynn. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. But if some family members will not take care of their own family members, they have rejected the faith and are worse than the unbelievers. Because the end of our faith is love, is charity. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so that is not, you know, allowing godliness and love to come out of you. You know? So you're denying the faith. Family should take care of family. It is interesting that the whole family of God is in two realms, as it says in Ephesians 3.15. So, um, let's go there, Ephesians 3.15. We'll take a look at that. Okay. So, he says, Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Okay? So, we're, it, we're all named after earth, Jesus Christ. So, um, verse... The next verse, wh whose turn is it? Um, verse 8. Um, Lauren? Verse 8? Verse mm -hmm. 9. nine. <laughs> okay, verse 9. Let not a widow be taken into number under threescore years old, having 
been the wife of one man. Okay, can you read 10 also? Well reported of for good works, if she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. So, um, in the early church, they had a list of those widows that were they were to be helping. A score is 20 and three score is 60. Paul says, don't add a widow to the list if she's under 60 years old. Because if she is under that age, she should be able to either work or find another husband. She should only have had one husband. She should be well reported of, have a great reputation of good works. The best things we can do for someone is to lead them to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. Um, then Paul mentions some good works. Raised children, extended hospitality to allow people to stay in her home. If she has washed the dust of the road off the feet of the saints. If she has helped people who are suffering, sick and, or poor. And if she has diligently followed every good work. So this is a catch-all phrase, meaning that she works hard to treat others well in the Lord, you know, and also, you know, she's sharing the gospel um, because that's, you know, the, mo one, the most important work that we can, any ambassador for God can do. Verse 11, Maureen. But the younger, younger window, widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry. Paul says... Refuse to make the younger widows part of that number that receive aid, financial assistance. Oh, I always wondered what that meant. Um, so, to, uh, for, you know, the widows mm -hmm. under 60 refuse them, right, um, to be in that number. And if they, are being, if they are being materially provided for and they don't have to worry about money, they will wander from Christ and seek to be married. See, uh, they will marry at the end of that verse. Wanton means wandering, roving, running to excess in wild pleasure, indulging in sensuality without restraint, lustful. While Webster's can be useful, the Bible has its own built-in dictionary. James helps us to understand the word wanton. It me, uh, and what it means. He says in verse James 5.5, 5, Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. That was James 5.5. 5. They have behaved lustfully as in the day of the golden calf at Mount Zion. Um when the Levites sided with Moses and slaughtered the rebels. That was in Exodus thirty-two twenty-six. Wanton is someone who lives for temporal pleasures in his life without respect to the eternal things of God. Verse 12, Lynn. Is it, is it your turn? No, it's, no, it's Patty. Okay, okay, go Patty. Having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. What does Paul mean by having damnation, which also means condemnation? Because um, when you do a word search, you find Paul using those interchangeably. Um, this is the reaping and sowing principle for this life and reward at the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Galatians 6, 7 and 8. Paul uses the word damnation four times. In Romans 3, 8, 13, 2, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine, and here. In every case, it has to do with the loss of temporal reward, of the believer and not with salvation, not loss of salvation. 
we suffer from the bad choices we make. Mm. There are consequences for behavior in this life and the life to come. The younger widows were not putting Christ first in their lives. They were more interested in the things of the world, material things, sensual things that have no eternal purpose or value. They were living for themselves, not for God. Paul said that in the last days, men should be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God in 2 Timothy 3.4. The young widows will have less godliness and less spiritual satisfaction and loss of reward because they have grown cold toward God. Actually, they've grown cold towards Christ. Okay. They only care about themselves like Demas who love this present world, as it says in 2 um, Corinthians 4.10. Uh, I mean, I, I think that's supposed to be 2 Timothy 4.10. Yeah. Fix that. <laughs> 2 Timothy 4.10. Okay, let's go there. Let's go there. 2 Timothy 4.10. Um, and we'll see it with our own eyes when it talks about Demas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. go ahead, uh, Lynn. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Okay, stop there. So, you know, we, we have a choice. We can open our Bibles and read God's Word, or we can put on, you know, <clears throat> something else on the television, or, or, you know, use our time otherwise. You know, we have a choice, and we should... You know, we know what our choice should be, right? Mm -hmm. um, we suffer... Okay, so we, we talked about that. Um, God doesn't want us to waste our life on earth. He wants us to have something of value at the judgment seat of Christ. Paul told the Corinthians, There is a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth of the things of the Lord that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married carried for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. 1 Corinthians 7, 34. A believer can't lose their salvation, but we can give place to the devil if we walk after our flesh, our old man. Believers and unbelievers can be used by Satan. Paul says, neither give place to the devil, in Ephesians 4.27. If we persist with wrong behavior, we can open the door to being used by Satan. The spirit in us is renewed by the word of God, and we should walk by faith in what Christ has told us in the doctrine he gave to us through Paul. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, Galatians 5.16. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5.25 Verses 13 and 14. Whose turn is it? Okay, go then. And withal they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which ought not. In which they ought not. In which they ought not. I will therefore that the younger mar women marry, Bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Okay, so he, mm -hmm. Paul just, you know, he's so practical. Mm -hmm. He just gave a list of bad mm -hmm. choices that someone could be making in this lifetime. Okay? You know, being t uh, idle, tattlers, mm -hmm. busybodies. So if someone's on welfare, you know, they don't have to worry about, you know, their rent. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't have to worry about their food. Your idle mm -hmm. time. They have all of that time to do bad things, okay? Mm -hmm. so, if, so if the younger widows have their food and rent paid by the church, this welfare will give them time on their hands to get in trouble. Paul wants the widows under 60 to remarry so their husbands can pay for them. Paul is very practical. They are to bear children and guide the house so they will be busy. There is truth in the saying, idleness is the devil's workshop. Then she will not have time on her hands to gossip or be tattlers or busy about other people's business, saying things she should not. Women should also not 
be false accusers and slander others. It says um, in Titus, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, that's sober-minded, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, but it could be like a double entendre. They should also be, you know, sober from alcohol, right? Chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husband, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Titus 2, 3 through 5. People should not use social media for gossip either. Women who work keeping the home, raising the children to be godly, homeschooling, and doing other family things are very busy. Yes, we can <laughs> all identify We can with all that. say yes to that. Mm -hmm. This is the point Paul is making in these verses. Paul had already said a similar thing in chapter 2. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved from deception in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. He said that in 2.15. Uh, verse 15, Lauren. For some are already turned aside after Satan. Some of the young women are already turned away from Apostle Paul's godly doctrine to Satan. They were doing the devil's work by gossiping. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> Not good. Okay. Uh, verse 16, Maureen. If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. Parents and grandparents provided for them in the past. Now it's the grown children's turn to lovingly, graciously, and respectfully care for their aged relatives. If any man or woman have a widow, they should relieve them from the stress of not having enough finances to care for themselves. So the church will not have to pay for them. So the church can relieve the widows who really have no one to care for them. Verse 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Okay, we're going to camp out on these verses a little tiny bit. The elders that rule well are worthy of double recognition and double payment for their service, especially those who are disciplined to study and teach true doctrine. The pastors and deacons who labor in the word and to keep the doctrine the same as when Christ gave it to us through Paul are worthy of double honor, our support and encouragement. We should do all we can to support their ministry. Their wives and children should also be honored because of their sacrifice to allow the church leaders time to study and present God's word. It is often true that behind every great man is a great woman. Frequently, the pastor's wife will teach the children in the church and take care of the baby so the members of the congregation can be spiritually edified by the sermons. The women often prepare food for the assembly while the men help to set up and clean up the tables, chairs, podiums, timeline, microphone, and so on. These men and women and their children deserve our appreciation. Only the Lord knows who has sacrificed more. However, we must all also do our own Bible study. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 Those who teach the Bible generally learn most. The responsibility of teaching someone else forces us to know what God is saying more accurately. Therefore, if anyone has the opportunity to teach a family member, friend, or someone else the word of God rightly divided, they should take it. You've, you've all seen how I do it, and you know, you can all do it too. 
But make sure that they are saved and have trusted the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, 4, first. There are so many people who are ignorant of the doctrine to the body of Christ um, that was given to Paul by Christ. As I have said many times, it's all hands on deck. How do we support the pastors and their families? who are doing the Lord's ministry on earth, be respectful. Pastors and their families should never be spoken badly about publicly or privately without a cause. Mature saints learn how to study to be quiet and to do their own business and to work with their own hands as we commanded you, 1 Thessalonians 4.11. Um, so we study and we learn how to keep our mouths shut. Pay attention. We don't want to say anything that could mar somebody else's ministry. Mm -hmm. Pay attention when he speaks. When your pastor is speaking, you know, or your teacher is speaking, pay attention. Mm -hmm. Help set up and clean up. Help teach the children in the nursery. We support our Lord's work by supporting Bible-believing pastors and teachers who teach God's Word rightly divided. Share their teaching in written form or on video, in emails, on YouTube, Facebook, or social media, on DVD, or in books and pamphlets with um, your family, and friends, and the general public. We should also support their ministries financially by grace giving. We are not under Israel's tithe, which <coughs> means the tenth. We can give any amount we want, even more. God loveth a cheerful giver, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. And it is more blessed to give than to receive, Acts 20, 38. We are all to work together to do God's will, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2, 4. A spiritually mature son or daughter joins in the father's business, doing what God is doing now. Uh, verse 18, whose turn is it? For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not m muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. The ox should not be muzzled. He should be allowed to eat some grain for encouragement and as a reward for his work. Paul quoted Deuteronomy 25, 4 here. And in 1 Corinthians, he does again. He says, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox, the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care of oxen, or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt. This is written, That he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that threshes, threshes in hope should be a partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Money. If others be partakers of this power over you, if you're giving money to other people, are not we rather, Paul and his group? Nevertheless, we have not used this power. Paul did not use that authority. But suffer all things, lest we should be should hinder the gospel of Christ. 1 Corinthians 9, 9 through 12. Apostle Paul did not want to take any money for his work, but I believe that it's fine for a pastor to take a wage from the church. It is best that the deacons collect it and not tell the pastor who paid what, so they will not be swayed to show favoritism. <laughs> Not like our politics. Yeah, not like <laughs> our politics. Interestingly, Paul also quotes Luke. Look up here. See, the, uh, in the verse 18, the laborer is worthy of his reward. Mm -hmm. That's from Luke. Oh. Okay. Um, 10, 7. Which means that the gospel of Luke had already been written and accepted as scripture at, by, um, at, in Paul's time. Of course, you know, they were friends. Okay, so church leaders 
should be paid for their work by the church so they can have the freedom to spend time in the Word of God and share more truth with the assembly. Paul mentions this principle in other passages too. Let him that is taught in the Word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Galatians 6.6 6. The communication there is communicate financially. Um, whose turn is it? Verse 19. Uh, Lauren? Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. A matter should not even be considered uh, unless there are two or three witnesses. God states the same principle in the Old and New Testament in Deuteronomy 17.6. Um, let's, let's go there. Deuteronomy 17.6. Who wants to read that? Okay. At the mouth of two wit uh, witnesses, or two or uh, witnesses or three witnesses, shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness, he shall not be put to death. Now, in Deuteronomy, turn to chapter 19. We're going to read in chapter 19 in a minute. but um, So, <clears throat> not quite yet, but uh, we're going to start in verse 15 in a minute. One person's accusation is not enough. At least two people need to accuse a person of the same thing before a charge is taken seriously. Satan attacks the message and the messenger. Our Lord described how the kingdom on earth's church should handle disagreements. Our Lord described um, most should be handled privately unless the person will not change their mind. Then it should be, you know, you bring more elders in mm -hmm. Matthew 18, 15 through 17. Mm -hmm. If an accusation is made against an elder, diligent inquisition should be made unto the matter, which does not mean torture like the Roman Catholic used to do. That's why we're going to read now Matthew, Deuteronomy 19, 15 through 21. I'm going to read that. Okay. So Deuteronomy 19, 15. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin. In any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. And remember we already said that God says something two times, it's established. Mm -hmm. And remember when we talked last week about the sheet being taken up to heaven that had mm -hmm. the clean and the unclean animals, mm -hmm. that was three times. Mm -hmm. So that was the three times witnesses. Isn't, isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. It was sort of like the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost were all in agreement that God had changed its dealings with mankind during the mystery. If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both is very fair. Mm -hmm. Just an accusa accusation doesn't make one guilty. A person is considered innocent until proved guilty. Remember that it came out that Supreme Court Justice Kavanaugh was innocent and the woman's accusations were false? Mm -hmm. It is a serious matter to make false accusations. Mm -hmm. Turn to 2 Timothy 3.3. 3. Second Timothy 3.3. 3. Who wants to read that? Okay, Lynn? Without natural affection... Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Okay, stop there. Um, go now to uh, Titus 2.3. Titus 2.3. Who wants to read that? Okay, so in this list was false accusers mm -hmm. of, and those who are despisers of good. So, mm -hmm. you know, that lady was a despiser 
of, of what was good mm -hmm. when she testified against Judge Kavanaugh. Mm -hmm. And we know what she deserves because, you know, according to the law. Okay, go ahead. And, uh, who wants to read that, um, Lauren? The aged woman, women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Okay, so mm -hmm. false accusers. Um, Paul keeps reminding people not to be false accusers. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul and his motives were falsely accused. Paul was accused. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Paul said, Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. And he said that, you know, in 1 Corinthians 9 3. Our Lord Jesus Christ was falsely accused and innocent when he was crucified. I know of grace pastors and teachers who have been falsely accused. Verse 20, whose turn is it? Patty, is it your turn? Or? Uh, them that oh. sin rebuke before all, all uh, that others may also, uh, that others also may fear. Okay, you remember in Deuteronomy, he said, do this so that others may fear. Remember? Mm -hmm. Did I miss you, Maureen? You yeah. Oh, oh your I'm turn? sorry. Okay, you can, you can have 21 then, when we get there. Okay. The elder in 5.1 was an older man. In this verse, it is an elder in leadership that has sinned. So here it says, you know, so God, he's not contradicting himself. In, in 5 1, he said, Don't rebuke an elder. Remember? Mm -hmm. But now he's saying, Then that sin rebuke before all. So he's talking about erring elders right now. Mm -hmm. You know, but he's talking about um, an elder who's in leadership that has sinned. Okay? So he's not talking about your average elder. It's mm -hmm. elders in leadership. Mm -hmm. If an elder has sinned publicly and others know about it, then they should be rebuked publicly. Elders should be rebuked uh, publicly if they are teaching, saying, or doing something that can harm the church, the doctrine, or its members. Paul rebuked Peter's actions publicly when he visited the believers in Antioch. Peter had been eating with Gentiles because he knew that God was no longer making a distinction between Jews and Gentiles in this dispensation of grace. But when certain from James came, he hypocritically withdrew himself and ate only with the Jews, as it says in Galatians 2, 11 through 21. Mm -hmm. By his actions, Peter built the middle wall of partition that, separ that separates the circumcision from the uncircumcision. When, when God mm -hmm. makes a distinction between the Jews, the circumcisions, and everybody else, the Gentiles, the uncircumcision, then he's putting the Jews on a higher, above the Gentiles, okay? He's showing, you know, preferred nation status mm -hmm. to the Jews, mm -hmm. okay? So that's not what's going on. The Jews has fallen, remember? We read that last week mm -hmm. in Romans 11, okay? Mm -hmm. So, um, the middle part of the wall of partition is down, Okay, go to Ephesians 2.14. Ephesians 2.14. Um, okay. So, I want you to see where it says middle wall of partition and what, what's, where it is right now. It says, For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. So he's made Jews and Gentiles one in the body of Christ. So Jew, there's no distinctions between Jews and Gentiles in the body of Christ. And uh, middle, uh, he has broken down the middle wall partition in the dispensation of grace. Again, which was uh, so it's down in the and so the middle wall of partition mm -hmm. is up when God shows preferred nation status to the Jews, the circumcision above the uncircumcision of Gentiles. Peter may have been a little intimidated by James. Nevertheless, he should, because he started eating just with the Jews, making it seem like there was that middle wall of partition again. 
Nevertheless, he should, even if he was intimidated by James, you know, we could all have been intimidated by James. Mm -hmm. um, he should stick up for what is true. What is true is that God had inserted the mystery and changed his dealings with mankind. Peter accepted the rebuke and did not hold a grudge against Paul and calls him our beloved brother Paul in 2 Peter 3.15. Go there. 2 Peter 3.15. 2 Peter 3.15. These are, these are, remember, I'm going to tell you when Peter used his keys. Okay? We are going to get there. All right. 2 Peter 3.15. Are you all there? Mm -hmm. Are you are you in 2 Peter 3.15? Uh-oh, did it run out? Low battery. Low battery? Uh -huh. Okay, so don't it worry about it. Okay, 20%. This should have enough. Yeah, okay. just ignore it. 2 okay. Peter 3.15, are you all there? The end of 2 Peter. 2 Peter, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Mm -hmm. So he's saying that the long suffering that's going on in the dispensation of grace mm -hmm. is so that Jews and Gentiles can be saved. Mm -hmm. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them. So he calls him beloved brother Paul after he had been chewed out. Mm -hmm. You know, that takes a mature man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So he says, in which, um, in, okay, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest or twist, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so he's saying that Paul's writings are scripture. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing that ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led astray with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Okay, so during the tribulation, they're going to stay steadfast, the uh, believers at that time. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. So, you know, that's almost saying, it could be saying that, you know, they can grow in grace right now. They can grow in grace right now because that's what God is offering. He's offering grace and peace. Um, so, it, it's very fascinating um, how this all ties together. So, Peter had already used his keys to lose Paul's ministry. Okay, remember that he was given the keys in Matthew 16, 19? Let's look at that real quick. Matthew 16, 19. I'm going to show you where the keys are. Given Matthew 16, 19. Okay, it says, And I will give unto thee. That's singular. That's why we have the these and thou's in the King James Bible. The D is a singular. Anything that starts with a T is a singular. And anything that starts with a Y is plural. So D meaning Peter. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So now go to Acts um, 15.22. Acts 15.22. This is where Peter used his keys to help Paul. Mm -hmm. Acts 15.22. Okay. Um, is everyone there? No. No. Okay. <laughs> Alright, get over there. Yeah, because that's it. Okay. Yes. I'm going to move in there. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. All right. So the, the the verse that I'm looking for it says. Um, Sixteen twenty-two. Yeah. Fifteen twenty-two. Yeah. It's it's it, it's in 15, Acts fifteen. 20? It's in Acts fifteen. Oh. Um, it, but it's actually fifteen eleven. Okay. Fifteen eleven. 
Okay. But we, that's the Jews that are there at the Jerusalem Council, believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we, the Jews at the Jerusalem Council, shall be saved even as they, the Gentiles, in the dispensation of grace. Okay? So this, this is here when... Um, Peter stood up. Okay, let's go to 7. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So that was Cornelius. And, and remember they all spoke in tongues mm -hmm. after they heard the truth, before they got wet. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness. That's how they, you know, they, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, because they spoke in the tongues, as a sign to the Jews who were with Peter. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Patty, don't do anything. Um, now, therefore, why tempt ye God? to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. No one could keep the law. But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, God, the Lord Jesus Christ is so gracious that um, we, the Jews, shall be saved. See how it says, shall be saved? Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. They'll be saved at the second coming of Christ. We're already saved when we believe the gospel, mm -hmm. even as they. Mm -hmm. So, isn't that interesting? Yes. Okay. So, uh, Israel's yes. salvation is yet future, while we have ours now. Sinful men should not hold church office. They should be relieved of their duty and be rebuked publicly, so others will not want to do the same evil thing. Remember that... The fear that came upon the kingdom on earth church when Ananias and Sapphira mm -hmm. were caught lying to the Holy Ghost mm -hmm. in Acts 5.5. 5. Mm -hmm. That was scary. Yeah. Corruption should not be covered up, but dealt with. Open rebuke is better than secret love, it says in Proverbs 27.5. Timothy or the bishops should do the rebuking. There is a chain of command to be followed in the congregation. However, members may lodge a complaint to the leaders, but they have to follow that chain of command. Okay, do, do 21, Maureen, verse 21. We only, we only have 25, so we're, we're good. We're almost there. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Timothy should not let one person be excused and then be harder on another person. Paul mm -hmm. solemnly orders Timothy before God and the elect angels, which are the good angels, um, um, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who are watching, okay, the good angels are watching, that Timothy should do all these things that Paul had said fairly, without preferring one before another. Mm. Um, verse 22, Patty. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Laying on of hands is a symbolic gesture which God began when Levite men were set apart to serve him in Numbers 7.10. Paul does not want Timothy to be hasty in appointing men to office. If he appoints someone who sins, he is a partaker with him. Timothy should keep himself pure from joining in other men's sins. Okay, so did you get that? If he appoints someone that's not going to be a good person for that appointed office, mm -hmm. and they sin, he's a partaker. Mm -hmm. He's, as, you know, uh, what do you, you say? Oh. Uh, okay, he's in oh. league with him. Yeah. Okay. Uh, verse 23, uh, Lynn. 
Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Being an overseer, bishop, or pastor, or deacon is not for the faint at heart. It takes someone with guts, a strong stomach, to have to publicly rebuke an elder. The pressure and difficulty of publicly rebuking a leader in the church could give some ulcers. For Timothy, this was probably a real challenge because he had a tendency to be timid. Paul told the Corinthians, Now if Timotheus come, see that he may be with you without fear. For he worketh the work of the Lord, as I also do. 1 Corinthians 16.10 He reminded Timothy that God has not given us a spirit of fear in 2 Timothy 1.7 This verse implies, this verse that we just read, Drink no longer water, implies that Timothy was one who not only abstained from certain foods, but also from wine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, perhaps he abstained from some foods because of stomach problems. Mm -hmm. Paul urges him to take a little wine for medicinal reasons as a prescription. Mm -hmm. Although the Bible doesn't explicitly mm -hmm. teach total abstinence from alcohol, it is wise not to drink alcohol. Just like I would not play with a deadly snake, I personally abstain from alcohol because I learned a long time ago about the danger of wine. At last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Proverbs 23, 32. The virtuous woman told her son, the king, not to drink wine in Proverbs 31, 4. Timothy was often sick, which demonstrates that Paul no longer had the gift of healing and that God does not intervene physically to heal people in this dispensation. God is intervening spiritually through the believers and can give doctors wisdom to help the sick people. Verse 24, Marie. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. Paul warns Timothy, saying that some men's sins are open and easy to spot and disqualify them from leadership appointments, but some men's sins will not become evident until after they have been given leadership responsibility. These are the ones who have to be stopped, publicly rebuked, and put out of office and possibly out of the church, as it says in Proverbs 22.10. Um, verse 25, Patty. Okay. Likewise also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. Likewise, some people's good works are evident before they are appointed to office. Those who are not good will eventually be found out. Be sure your sins will find you out. It says in Numbers 32, 23. However, sometimes their sins will not be known or judged until the great white throne judgment. Nothing can be hid from all-knowing God. We find many parallels in, for us in body Christ in Israel's program, which also apply to us. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Hebrews 4.13 God knows and sees everything. Nothing is going to escape his notice. So we have to, uh, you know, be honest. And we have to be careful what we do and how we behave. Mm -hmm. Because there's consequences to our, our bad choices. So there are some things that are trans-dispensational truths. Some truths are, you know, true no matter what dispensation you're in. Okay? And that was one of them. God sees it all. <laughs> We're forgiven of our sins, but we have to live with the... <laughs> yeah, we have to... Yeah. The consequences. We have to live 
we have free will, and we, but we have to live with the consequences of our sin. Um, so let's close with a word of prayer. Thank you for joining us. Dear Father in Heaven, in Jesus' name, we uh, thank you that we are accepted by you through your Son, that we are in Him and He is in us. And we pray that um, you will use this little Bible study to edify many people and that uh, people will have something at the judgment seat of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> something of value. Okay, Patty, you can turn it off. Thank you for filming. Okay, yeah, we'll close that. <laughs>